Well, you can go ahead and have a seat. It's good to be with you guys this evening. My name is Robert. I'm one of the pastors. And uh, I invite you to open your Bible to the book of Colossians chapter 2. If you're using one of the Bibles in the chair in front of you uh, and you don't have a Bible, feel free to make it your own, not just for this service, but if you need to take one home, please do so. Uh, we'll be on page uh, 1,169 if you want to use that. Uh, and uh, before we get started, i got one more announcement I want to tack on to the ones that, that Pastor Pete shared, and that is that uh, this coming weekend, uh, not this weekend, obviously, we already started, but next weekend, I'll be leading our mission trip to Mexico. We're going down uh, just south of Ensenada to build a home for a family in need. And we had some cancellations this past week, so I have, I think, six uh, spots available if you'd like to join me. It'll be a Friday, Saturday, Sunday trip. We'll head down there, uh, do a home build, uh, dedicate that, and celebrate with the family, and then head home. So information's on the website, or you can see me after if you've got questions and would like to jump in on that. But hey, uh, we are kicking off our Kingdom Relationship Series, and I hope you uh, you're looking forward to this um, because sometimes we get some groans and we say, oh, we're going to do a marriage series because some, some of you that are uh, married and kind of established groan because you think, oh, we're going to stir some stuff up and I got to you know, talk about my feelings and all that stuff. Uh, or some of you maybe are like, well, I don't have a spouse, so what am I going to do for the next few weeks? And I just get to sit here and uh, fake it, or what am I going to do? And, and, and so I love this because it's just about relationships in general. And no matter where we find ourselves, if you're single, you're married, you're divorced, or widowed, or you're just like, hey, how do I interact with people around me better? This uh, will seek to, to do that. Uh, and I'm excited for this for the sense that I think any time that we pause to say, hey, what is God's design and intent for my life in an area? And we we seek to fall in line with that, then our life is blessed as we seek to be more obedient to Christ. And that's what we're going to do. We're essentially saying, hey God, we wanna pause and ask for some directions here uh, in this area of our life. But here's the tension with that, and that is that we don't really like taking directions, do we? And thankfully, the, the advent of smartphones has completely removed that conversation of like, hey, stop at the gas station and ask for directions. It never actually helped. Um, but there's all these other areas that it still exists in our life. We don't actually like to think that we need direction on things. It might be something we've never done before, something brand new. We're like, oh, I know how to do this. Or maybe it's a guy thing. I don't know. We'll, we'll start with that at least. But we like to think that we know how to assemble things that we've never owned, or, or we know what speed we should be driving, or regardless of what that nice sign says. Or, or, or we like to think, well, I can set up this new gadget without reading the manual, and then we get halfway in and we're full of frustration, because that's what happens. We think we don't need instruction and direction, and we find ourselves frustrated and worn out and burnt out by struggling against the thing that we're trying to do. But it isn't always that way. Sometimes it works out. Sometimes our intuition leads us correctly. Sometimes we go, oh, I'm not gonna look at the, the directions or read the manual, and we figure it out. Sometimes we go, oh, I, I, I'm just gonna follow my gut, and we, we find a way, we get to where we're going, we accomplish our task, and that's the tension. Sometimes our intuition is correct, and sometimes it isn't. And the more significant the thing is, the more important it is to really say, hey, let's not just wing it, let's not just follow our intuition, but instead, Let's get some direction. That's why we get this nugget of truth in Proverbs chapter three. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. See, if we were doing a, a sermon series called you know, what the Bible doesn't say, I'd love to start with the, the phrase of, oh, just trust your gut or follow your heart. Because the Bible doesn't say that. And in fact, it says quite the opposite. It says to follow God and trust his wisdom, not our own. So when we look at something as important as relationships, something that, that, that we interact with on a daily basis, something that has the potential to incredibly bless or incredibly damage our life, let's not follow our, our gut, our instincts, our intuition, but instead let's say, hey, what's God say about this area of our life? And that's what we're gonna be doing over the next several weeks. And um, these first few weeks especially are kind of foundational items of where, where's the foundation of God's idea for relationships? And today we're starting with an idea of uh, the fulfillment that our relationships can bring. And, and because I think all of us have this instinctual idea that our relationships should complete us or fulfill us or bring us wholeness. And so we want to kind of look at that. We'll look at Colossians 3, but instead I want to... Uh, Instead of just jumping there, I want to look at some things we need to know first. 
And the first is that we have a natural desire for fulfillment. See, God created us as human beings with natural desires and cravings and, and uh, things that we desire out of life. You look at the beginning and, and we are given some of these natural desires and one of those is a natural desire to connect relationally with other people. And you look at the very beginning of, uh, of all of human history, which is recorded for us in the book of Genesis. In Genesis, it walks through God creating everything that we have here today. And as it goes through this, there's, there's a rhythm that takes place. There's a rhythm where God spends a day creating something, and Genesis gives us an account of what was created, and then God pauses and steps back and assesses what was done, and he says, it is good and for five days, there's an account of God creating and then stepping back and saying, it is good. Creating and then stepping back and saying, it is good. And on the sixth day, we see God creates the living things. He creates animals and he creates the first man, Adam. And it pauses and God says, it is not good that man should be alone. And he continues and he creates Eve. He creates a, a partner, a companion, a wife for Adam. So for the first time in creation, God pauses and says, oh, hold on, something isn't good here. Now, does that mean that, that God made a mistake on day six of creation? And I was like, oh, whoops, we gotta, we gotta correct this. No, I think that that's an intentional thing that, that God did to pause and say, hey, I want you to notice something here. I want you to notice that, that you are, are created for community, you're created for connection and relationships. But that's not the only thing that we see in that first part of Genesis. We also see that, that Adam and Eve were in close community and, and connection with God himself. There's this idea that they're regularly communicating with God. God's giving them instruction and guidance. They're, they're communicating on a regular basis. And, and we see this when they choose to go against God's instructions. In Genesis 3, they, they eat of the tree that they were instructed not to, and following this, it says this. It says, and they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden of the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And there's not a lot of detail about what their daily life looked like prior to this, but we kind of get the idea that this isn't a new thing for God's presence to be there uh, in the midst of the garden. They're not like, whoa, what's going on? God's here now. It, it's almost as if this is a regular daily occurrence that they had in community with God himself. So it's not that there in the garden, Adam and Eve were complete just in their relationship with each other, but the thing that brought them completeness was their communion and connection with their creator. And so we're created for uh, fulfillment and, and wholeness in these areas. But the problem is that we seek fulfillment in the wrong things. See, part of the struggle is that, that we look at these desires that we have and we seek to fulfill them in ways that God didn't design us to do it. And, and in a broader sense, this is true of almost any desire that we have. God's given us all these good and natural desires that we seek in our life, but sin is us seeking to fulfill a God-given desire in a God-forbidden way. But specifically in this area of, of fulfillment and wholeness and completeness, we take this natural desire that we have to connect and, and, and feel a part of something bigger than ourselves, and we direct it away from the creator who made us that can give us that feeling and, and experience of fulfillment. And instead of seeking to connect with our creator, we look to things like success or achievement. We think, oh, if I can just uh, climb the, the ladder, if I can just hit this level of success, if I can just achieve my goals and do these things, then I'll feel accomplished. I'll feel like I have an impact in this world that's bigger than myself. But it, it never leaves us feeling whole. Or maybe it's not that, maybe it's money or possessions, and we think, oh, if I can just hit this income level, if I can just uh, work my way up to get to this point, then I'll feel set. And I've talked to so many people that, are, that have said, hey, I, I had this, this number in my head that if I could just hit this number, I'd feel great. But I hit that number years ago, and it just keeps moving. Because it never will fulfill us. Or, or maybe more pertinent to our conversation in this season of our time here at Calvary, maybe we think it's our relationships that will fulfill us. 
May we understand that that desire is a relational desire, and so we look to the human relationships around us and think that if we can just get into a relationship, then we'll feel satisfied. Or if we can get out of a relationship, we'll feel happy. (laughs) Or maybe we think, well, if my spouse would just be better, then my life would be better. Here's the problem, we're we're seeking fulfillment, we're seeking wholeness from something that wasn't ever created to do that. See, uh, there's still a place for those human relationships, there's still a place for marriage and companionship in our life, but the problem is if we think that's the ultimate point of our life, we've got it backwards. Or also, if we think that the purpose of marriage, the purpose of relationships is for us to feel complete, then we're gonna be disappointed. Because it's not like Jerry Maguire says, they won't complete us. If we're single looking for a companion, that isn't the thing that's going to fill the void. If we're married and we're still frustrated and longing, it's not your spouse's fault, it's it's yours for thinking that your spouse will ever make you feel complete and whole. Because people were never intended to fill that role in our life. See, these relationships have their place, but the thing we have to understand bigger than that is that being in relationship with Jesus is what completes us. Not the human relationships, not the human uh, accomplishments and achievements and activities here on earth, but being in relationship with Jesus is the thing that completes us and makes us feel whole. So with that, let's take a look at Colossians chapter two. We'll start in verse six and see uh, how this speaks to this moment. Colossians 2 says this, it says, therefore, as you've received Christ in the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to the human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of this world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Do you hear what it says at the end? You have been filled in him. Other translation says you have been made whole or you have been completed in him. See, this shows us that it, the, the fullness, the, the, the fulfillment, the completeness that we're longing for is only found in Jesus. But this also gives us, I think, a roadmap of how we find that. So let's talk about how we find wholeness in Jesus. Because I think it gives us some instructions here, and if we're going to say, hey, we understand that the the human relationships, the human activities, the, the things we do here on earth aren't going to complete us, how do we find wholeness and completeness in Jesus? The first thing that we need to understand is this is found by walking with Jesus. We need to walk with Jesus. Starts there at the beginning. As you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. See, it it reminds me a little bit of what we see Adam and Eve in the garden. They're walking with the Lord. They're in community and connection with him. And we're told here in Colossians to walk with Jesus. There's, it's relational. It's, it's communal. It's not just, hey, you know, do some action or activity, but it's connect with him in a relational way. Walk with him on a regular basis. At Calvary, we believe that, that the wholeness that we all long for in life is found in Jesus, but it's not found in religious activity. It's not found by following rules or checking off lists, but it's found in relationship. It's found in a life-changing relationship where Jesus, where you say, hey, I know I'm a sinner in need of a savior, and I know that Jesus died on a cross as we celebrated last week for Easter, that he rose from the grave, and I wanna follow him with my life. And as we do that, we start that process of walking with him in a relational way. So if you have not gotten to that point of confessing Jesus as your savior and finding hope and fulfillment and forgiveness in him, that's your first step today. And if you need some help with this, you can fill out a connect card or there's a prayer team down here uh, after the service that would love to pray with you and walk uh, walk you through that process. Or you can find one of our pastors out front in the foyer. We'd love to pray with you and encourage you in that. But that's your first step. But if you have done that, let me ask you this. Are you walking with Jesus or just visiting him? 
because I think it's really easy to, to, to hear, oh, I need to give my life to Jesus and, and step into a life-changing relationship with him, but think that that's just a moment that we visit and then leave. And, and instead, what we're told here is to walk with him because if we want our soul to be nourished, we have to be walking with him on a regular daily basis. Because see, we understand that, that food nourishes us. And so we eat two, three, four, five, seven, however many times a day we eat, right? But if, but if God nourishes our soul and the only time we're engaging and connecting with him is here in this building, you might only be getting nourished two or three times a month. Now, that's not a push to say, hey, you need to be here every week, because guess what? That only moves you up to four times a month. And if, and if you're only eating food four times a month, you're gonna be in pretty poor health. And the same is true spiritually. So this instead is a push for you to be regularly, daily connecting with God, reading his word and engaging with him there. Daily praying to him and spending time with him in a relational way. It's a push for you to, to acknowledge Jesus' leadership in your life and submit to him on a daily basis and say, Jesus, you lead me in the direction I need to go. So, are you walking with Jesus or are you simply visiting him? Because if we want to feel the, the completeness, the wholeness, the fulfillment of God in our life, we need to walk with Jesus. Secondly, we need to be building our life around Jesus. Jesus. See, he says here that, that we're to walk in him, and then he says rooted and built up in him, established in faith, rooted in him. Now, I, I grew up here in the desert. I don't know a lot about growing things, so the idea of like roots and branches and stuff, that's a little beyond me, but I know about building things, so I wanna shift a little to like foundations and structure instead of roots and branches. And I think what we're being asked here is what's the foundation of our life and what are we building on that foundation? Because if we want to, to feel complete, if we want fulfillment in following God, we need to be building our life on Him. Not on ourself or our desires, our needs, our wants, our priorities, but be building it on Jesus. And Jesus speaks to this in Matthew 7. He tells a parable about two different builders who chose different foundations for what they were doing. And he tells this parable to show us the difference between building our life on him and building our life on ourselves. He says this, he says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand the rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. So what are you building your life on? Are you building your life on Jesus or on yourself? Are you building your life on Jesus or your career? Are you building your life on Jesus or your relationships and your kids? Are you building your life on Jesus or on your priorities? Because he, he spells out pretty clearly here that if we want our life to be stable, we need to make him the foundation of everything that we do. And every time that we seek to build our life on our preferences, our desires, our priorities, our agenda, we build a bigger and bigger house of cards that's just one storm away from destruction. So let's build our life on God. And the way that we do that is by looking at this final step, and that is that if we want the wholeness and fulfillment of God in our life, we have to understand and embrace his truth. See, the, the passage in Colossians continues. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of this world, and not according to Christ. See, we're told to be careful with the ideas that float around us, these different philosophies and deceits that come our way, but instead to look at what Christ says. And, and the truth that we need to understand is that the, there's all kinds of different ideas that float into our life that contradict, that go against what God's design for our life is. And it's not what uh, our world says about how to find fulfillment in life, it's about what God says. 
It's not about what our country says about marriage. It's about what God says. It's not about what our friends say about life, but what God's word says. And we need to to be building our life in a way that we're looking to say, hey, how do I better understand and embrace God's truth for my life? And the place we find this truth is, is the Bible, which is why every week we encourage you guys to, to take one of these if you don't have a Bible. And, and one of the coolest uh, kind of numbers that our staff shared uh, from Easter last weekend is that we needed to order six cases of Bibles to replenish the Bibles that were taken last Easter. And it's awesome because we really do believe that if you read and apply God's word, it will change your life. But that takes us back to the point. You have to read and apply. You have to understand and embrace. So what's that mean? Well, it starts with you gotta read it and study it and seek to understand what it says. You have to say, hey, what does God's word say about this area of my life? What does God's word say about this? And how do I seek to understand that better? But it can't stay there because you also have to embrace it, which is the process of allowing it to change your mind and change your actions and convict and rebuke you in ways that you're incorrect. Because see, simply understanding things isn't enough. I understand that eating better and going to the gym will result in better physical health, but I don't embrace that truth nearly enough. I understand what the white sign with black numbers on the sides of the road mean, but that doesn't mean I always embrace the speed limit that they represent. I understand a lot of things that I don't embrace, and so those things don't change my life. And the same is true of God's word. We can have a whole lot of knowledge and understanding of what it says and and the different nuances of it, but if we're not embracing it and letting it change how we live, nothing changes in our life. And I suspect that for many of you, there's a disconnect between the understanding and embracing steps here. I suspect that for many of you, you're in a place of of wondering why you don't feel more joy and excitement in following God. Why you don't feel more purpose and and, and joy in, in calling him your savior. Why you're wondering, man, why, why isn't this more meaningful in my life? And I suspect that if that's the case, there's a disconnect between your understanding and your embracing of God's truth. Because if we want God's word to transform our life and change us, we have to let it change us. We have to embrace and apply his truth to our life, and in not just the areas that we want it to, but in every area. And so maybe you're in a place of saying, well, I'm gonna follow it over here, but not in this area over here, because I don't like the implications there but instead we have to allow it to convict and rebuke and guide every aspect of our life. So today, if you're looking for a deeper experience of of experiencing purpose and fulfillment and completion in life, understand that a relationship with Jesus that's growing and active and uh, transformative is the only place you're gonna get that. And over these next few weeks, as we talk about relationships, you're gonna have the best marriage, the best friendships, the best relationships in the world, but if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you're not gonna feel complete. And so we have to start with the understanding that it's only in Jesus that we find completeness. It's only in him that we find fulfillment. It's only in him that we are made whole. And so today I pray that wherever you're seeking to find fulfillment, that you would find it in Jesus and that you would grow deeper in a relationship with him and that you would allow him to change the way you think and the way you live as you make him more of a Lord of your life and submit more of your life to him. Because when we step into that life-changing relationship with Jesus, we are made full in him. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for saving us. We thank you for giving us the opportunity to experience your life-changing truth today. And I pray today that, that you would help all of us, regardless of where we're at on our journey of following you, Help all of us to see the areas that we wander away from understanding that that you are the thing that fulfills us and gives us purpose and meaning and hope. God, it's easy to to think that the things that we do, the the things that we're a part of here in this world, that, that those are the things that make us whole. 
God, help us to understand that it's only in you that we find what we're looking for. And God, our prayer is that as we further pursue you, that everything else in our life gets better, that our relationships, our jobs, our, our, our activities, our families are blessed by putting you at the center and seeking fulfillment from you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.